Hi, I hear no poneki, no my hook my. Welcome back. Good evening from Wellington. We have Greg Baker with us here today. Greg Baker is an entrepreneur, author, translator, and an internationally water composer and musician. He also codes a bit. He's been running software that populates the Leaftop database, which has the goal of being the largest lexiconary and is also building a universal grammar extractor, which can currently inflect a plural from a singular for 11% of the world's nouns. This talk is for language geeks and machine learning nerds. No, my Greg. Well, some tentative first steps towards a Star Trek universal communicator. And I've noticed that a lot of people have been giving acknowledgements of the land that they're on at the moment. And I thought it'd be really appropriate to give an acknowledgement of the languages of the land that I'm bringing this from. Um, unfortunately, I can't. And that's because the Walla Medical's people were had their culture so completely destroyed by colonization that we don't even know what they called their language and thus it's called the sydney language because we don't know what else to call it and that's kind of tragic and when we lose a language we lose a part of what it is to be human and so it's rather sad to hear that we estimate that something like 50 to 90 percent of the languages that are spoken today will be dead by the year 2100 and there's a, a kind of cycle that we've seen happen time and time again that causes languages to die. You start anywhere around the circle and then um, rotate around, and after a few iterations around, the language is essentially gone. Um, so I'll just do an example. Start in the bottom right-hand corner, children's being sent to dominant language schools. So the, the Wu language, um, which is you know, one of the, the great connections we have to uh, middle era China, um, that kind of died when children were forced to go to Mandarin speaking schools by the, the CCP. And so that then meant that uh, moving across to the loss of culture just became a kitchen language, a language that you, you hear when you're at home and your parents speak it, but it's not something that you speak with your friends or anybody you know. And so the next step around that is you stop identifying with that minority language. Uh, and so the population of people in that who, who speak it declines, which means people who only speak that language they can't communicate with the wider population, so they have poor jobs prospects, which then means that they are all the more keen on sending their children to schools that speak the dominant language so they can get themselves out of that um, poverty rut. Um, and that is happening all over the world at the moment. Uh, I'll give you another one, uh, Chechua. This is 10 million speakers, so it's, it's like half the population of Australia spread out across South America it's our last connection to the Inca Empire. It's the language of the Inca Empire as it was sort of evolved, and it's dying. Um, in fact, the people who speak Chechua, if they're in the cities, they'll probably hide the fact that they can speak it uh, because of this you know, extreme level of I don't want to identify with my language and culture. At this point, you're probably thinking this is going to be one of these really depressing talks, um, but it's not because there are two things that are happening right now that, that are changing this, where we're breaking the cycle of language death in two ways that has never really happened before. Um, the first, which I'll talk about just for a few minutes um, first, is the idea of a language being associated with technology. And when that happens, when uh, you can start interacting with a computer in your own language, this then gives you this incredible sense of power and capability. Uh, and then the other half, of course, is as we get better machine translation, there's the possibility that this may also break the cycle of language death. Let me talk about the language associated with technology and have a just a quick pitch here. Um, there's a language that I'll use in this talk. Um, it has it goes by three different names. They're subtly different languages. Um, there's the language called Bishlama or Bislama, depending on uh, where you grew up. Um, in and that's the language that's spoken in Vanuatu. Strangely enough, it actually is the word for sea slug. 
Um, not many people name their languages after sea slugs, but that's what happened. Um, or Papua New Guinea, uh, it's called Tok Pisin. There's a couple of tiny little differences. Or the Solomon Islands, it's called Pigeon. And this is a language that's only really diverged from English for about 120 years. Uh, it derives from where uh, particularly Australian landholders captured a lot of Melanesians, forced them to work on sugarcane fields and on, on ships. So you end up with this language that has English grammar, but sorry, uh, English vocabulary, but Melanesian grammar, and then we've watched it diverge. Now, there's something like five to six million speakers of the language that I'll call Tok Pisin, um, mostly in Papua New Guinea, but all, all throughout Melanesia. And so I decided, just for fun, that I would um, pay Bradley and Jimmy um, to translate, as into localised Libra office, into uh, Bishlama. And um, if you want to donate, um, I'm aiming to raise $10,000, that will be enough to, um, to, to fully translate it and fully localise it. And the extraordinary effect that this has, because there's a bunch of people who are not comfortable with computers, not comfortable with English, and it's a double burden. And when they see, hey, I can actually operate in my language on a computer, it's like suddenly the world has opened up. It's, that, it's like that feeling you get when you first play around with uh, open source software and you suddenly realize, hey, this is, this is a community, this is a culture, this is something different. In previous versions of this talk, I used other languages, um, which nobody knew. Nobody will know these languages either, but it's kind of fun because you can kind of get a sense of um, when I sound out some of the words, It'll sort of sound familiar and sound right. Okay, so the other thing we have, the other tool in our toolbox is universal translation. Um, and what we want to do is we want to have the universal translator from Star Trek. Now, there's something that I need to say here um, that may be a shock to some people, and that is that Star Trek is actually fictional. It's, it's not a depiction of reality. Uh, so we don't actually have to follow how it works in Star Trek. Uh, in the original series, the Universal Translator worked by scanning the brainwaves of the alien species. Um, and in Enterprise, it was Hoshi's creation. Uh, but either way, what we notice is that the Star Trek Universal Translator can cope with really small languages. You land on a planet and there's only two um, people on the planet somehow the, the the crew are able to communicate with these like you know, aliens who might be the last of their species. And that's a key point because if you just want to translate big major languages, that's easy. Um, the, the process for building a translator for a major language is assemble a few million pairs of translated documents. So like you've got Maybe the proceedings of the European Union is a, is a good set where you've got document A, document B. You know that B is a direct translation of A. It'll be sentence for sentence translated. So you've got these um, you know, a couple of million sentence pairs that you can work with. And uh, as of about 2018, the um, hip new technology is to create a transformer, so deep learning with um, uh, tension mechanisms. And uh, you basically try to get it to predict the next token that comes out from a translation. I'll do an example of that a little bit later. And it works. And then if you throw in a speech recognition system, you probably only need a few thousand hours of correctly transcribed speech, and then you can get sort of in the 90% accuracy for speech recognition a um, bit more than that and you can start getting some really um, really accurate models but the problem is this beginning step first we assemble a few million pairs of translated documents uh, just to get a sense of how big that is so we'll in the keynote yesterday you know it was seven thousand lines of code in unix version six that i think um, Brian Kernighan mentioned. So the commentary on that gets you 254 pages. And that that's a lot of information. It's enough to launch an industry for, what is it, 50 years now. Um, and over on the right, I uh, took photographs of um, a large number of quite thick books. Actually, they're mostly uh, Bible variant translations. Now, 
a Bible translation gets you about 30,000 sentences in your target language. So that's a great start, but it's not sufficient on its own. And so just to give you a sense, um, in that stack there, you can see, you know, most of the books are, are Bibles and you get a sense of how, how thick they are. Well, that's about one thirtieth of what you need translated in order to start building a high level, full, effective, uh, major language translator. So that stack of books there that's 20 books high, that is not enough you would need to have more than that kind of corpus. And when you think about it, that's really hard. When you're talking about a language where there may be less than a million speakers, getting that much stuff translated... Oh, by the way, a, a Bible translation, which is, you know, they've got the process pretty well down pat. It's between five to 20 person years. Multiply that by about 30 years, what you need. You're talking about 150 to 600 person years worth of work to start building a deep learning based translator when you're starting to talk about low resource languages you just laugh at that and there's no way so you do whatever dirty tricks you can in order to extract as much vocabulary from whatever sources you have um, and then step two is learn the rules of the the, the, the rules of the uh, target languages grammar and then you should be able to synthetically put together some sentences. You can skip that step if you want to. Make your machine learning model and try to start generating translations. And then separate to that, you probably don't shoot for full speech recognition. Just shoot for um, recognizers that recognize when a word is spoken. Um, so just, did we hear this word or not? Um, and that gets you sort of a... a a starting point on some of these um, translation work. Well, so given that you can't do a really good job unless you have a million translated sentences, what's the best you can do with what little you have? Now, if I've managed to get this to work properly, I should be able to switch over here and I've got, um, here's the translation texts of just what uh, Jimmy and Bradley have managed to do so far. Um, you'll notice a few things here. Um, so like we're looking at the save menu. So I've just put my, my mouse up here. Looking at like the, the menu for save, that translates as save him um, or save as turns into save Olson. Um, and you can sort of hear the word save in there. And it's right. That's where it is actually coming from. Uh, you also see that the a CH often changes into an S. So you get, instead of change, you get sen and or senis. And so you can get like um, rename is uh, sense of the name and edit is senison. Um, okay, so we've got this vocabulary. There, in a few places, um, Bradley and Jimmy just sort of freaked out and said, I don't know how to translate templates. It's not a word that we've ever used in Tokpisan. We, we, we always use the English word. Um, so that was kind of interesting. All up, we've got about, uh, it's about 300 um, texts translated. Uh, you'll notice that there's big gaps where like hard stuff, like how, how do you translate these things? They, they might not exist or they might be difficult to say or whatever. Um, you also see that in general, um, Tokpisan is a lot more wordy than English. You tend to have a lot more words to say the same things and they're just spoken faster. Um, and so what if you wanted to just translate a single word? Let's say they hadn't done the translation for the word save, but we wanted to extend our localization and just grab that. Well, we can do that. Um, what you do is you start with all the translation texts that have the word save in them. And then you look across to Tokpisin and you say, what are all the words that appear in translations? Okay, well, there's Savem, there's Olsum, there's Narapela, there's Wok, there's Wankyan, there's True, there's Olsum, there's Dispella. And we can then ask the question, um, what's the probability that this word or this phrase is likely to be the translation of the word save? 
So if I now jump over to some code over here, let's see if I got the right one. Um, yep, this is the right code. Um, this surprisingly little infrastructure you needed to, in order to make this work. Um, I'm using Pandas and, um, and NumPy because it was convenient. Uh, the only thing I'm using out of SciPy is just a binomial test. The only thing I'm using out of NLTK. So NLTK is Natural Language Toolkit uh, for Python. It's the only thing I'm using it for is splitting words up, the word tokenization. Um, so jumping down through a bit of the text, I load in the uh, text from the the um, the localization um, stuff that uh, that Jimmy and, and Bradley have done, and uh, you can see there's I've removed save so that I'm not cheating. Um, save as, save a copy, close, open, and so on. And uh, let's just run through a little bit more. The crux of the, the, the code is actually in these two functions here, the every gram generator and the, the possible translation phrases. So the, the every gram generator basically says, you give me a sentence like, you know, the quick brown, and I'll return back to you the, the quick, the quick brown, quick, quick brown, and brown. Because I don't know how many words in Tokpisin corresponds to the, the word in English. So it might be that there's a phrase if I'm translating a single word, it's probably a phrase of of, letter, of words that come one after another. So just a little bit of optimization there. Um, so what I can do then is I can say all the possible translations of the word save. So these are all the things that I've seen where the word save appeared in English somewhere. What are all the words I've seen on the other side? And uh, and all the all the not just words, but phrases that uh, that appeared there. So, I think I took I mentioned dispeller computer when I was writing when I was reading something out earlier, um, and so on. There's there's literally hundreds of them. But what we can do is we can say, and this is the the core of the code here. I'm going to count up the number of times that I saw word A along with save, the number of times that's the together the number of times that it appeared in the English, and then the number of times that it just generally appears in the whole corpus. So like the word ol, for example, uh, it, it marks the accusative case in Doc Pearson. So it's in lots and lots and lots of sentences. Um, and um, so you'd see that in lots of places, and we need to sort of weight it by the fact that ol appears in lots of places, so it's very not likely to be the translation of the word save. Well, what happens when we guess the word save? Lo and behold, it actually works. And the probability is something absolutely astronomically small. It's like uh, 10 to the minus like 100 or something like that. So of course, it just comes up saying nothing there. And if I ask it to run through and find for me all the vocabulary that you possibly can, um, it does okay-ish. Um, so, Long pella means uh, a long thing, and that was a pretty good translation of the word length. Um, arg one, that seems right. Spellim is actually right. It's if I'm going to spell something, um, then that's the, the correct translation. Um, kind of amusing. Um, how do you say click? A mouse click? You press him long, press him belong to, to a thing. So some right, some actually completely bonkers wrong. Um, so um, I'm just looking at that last one. That doesn't look right to me. I actually don't even know how to say that, what that's actually saying. But that's that's wrong. But it got it somewhat right. And if your problem is you just need to get one word out in your target language, this is not a bad technique. It does kind of work. In fact, um, as I jump onto my next page of my slide, if it's not going to crash on me, um, I've actually done this on some very large number of um, of languages. In fact, I took Bible translations in 1,500 different languages, and it looks like my um, LibreOffice session is about to crash. I've just got the spinning beach ball of death. I had to switch over from my Linux box to the Mac because there were problems with my camera that uh, the tech session bothered complained about so i'm going to have to kill that and hopefully um 
restart it. So let's let's um, relaunch and um, hope that it behaves itself. Let me just check that I'm sharing my screen successfully here. It does not look very promising at, the, at all at the moment. It goes up to about here. And so I did this for like a very large number of languages and 28,000 CPU hours later, this kind of, I want to translate a single word, um, you can do it, get about sort of 70% accuracy out of it. But if you want to translate a sentence, now that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, I've put together a little GitHub repo. It's not um, state of the art or anything particularly special, but it is how you write a translator when you're dealing with very low resource languages. As I said, the problem you've got is if you've got a couple of million documents, you can use deep learning and that's very accurate. But deep learning machine learning models tend to be very hungry for data. And you wouldn't dream of trying to do this with like a hundred translation texts and expect it to work. But there are other machine learning algorithms that'll, that aren't as successfully accurate, but can at least get some improvements over a small amount of data. So linear methods like um, a linear uh, support vector machine or logistic regression or things like that, they can often cope with really small languages and give you like better than chance translations. So how does this work? So I've got on my left here, um, I've got a couple of things translated from English into um, top in. So the translation for next page is page tumbler. The adjective saying next happens after the noun. It, it's kind of flexible actually in, um, in top and you can sort of be a bit rough on that. Um, in this case, uh, the translators have, have chosen to put the noun first in both cases. First page, fe page Fespella. Um, so Fespella, like you can actually almost hear first fellow, which is where it actually comes from. And then finally with um, Painim, what's going on there is uh, P often substitutes for the letter F. Um, so hearing the English word find turned into pain and then the D got dropped off and then the IM is Melanesian grammar saying, um, you know, this is a, a, a transitive verb. Right, so given those, what do I set my machine learning model up to do? Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to get the first word of translation out. So I set up a training set and my training set says, if you see next and page, please emit page. If you see first and page, please emit page. And if you see search and for, then please emit painim. Then I, I then have a second machine learning model, or if I'm using a transformer, I can actually like incorporate that into the model itself that says, I'm going to give you some English words and one uh, top piss in word. So next page and page, please give me Tamblo. If you see first page and page, please give me Vespella. If you see search and for and painim, that's it, end. There's no more uh, words coming. You have completely translated that particular bit. And uh, I've got that coded up over here. Again, same sort of beginning. Um, I went through a variety of different scikit-learn uh, options um, to try and get a, a good model that worked reading the text as as per usual. And I just decided to work with uh, shorter texts um, to make the, the, the talk not take like three hours in training. And so these are the, the phrases that it knows about that have been translated by a human being. And our goal here is, could we translate some other terms into Tok Pisin that it hasn't seen by learning the rules that we used 
to what were the simplest set of rules that would have got you from English to talk this in? If we apply those rules to some unseen texts, how do you go? Now, after a little bit of playing around, I found that um, a random forest classifier happened to be the, the, the best option. I tried a few. It's a good compromise. It can cope with quite small data sets and still get reasonable accuracy, and it can still sort of kind of do that the you know, universal function approximation that is so useful out of uh, deep learning. Now, this make model function is doing two things at once. The first part is the, uh, the for loop here, where, oops, it zoomed past really quickly, where what it's doing is it's setting up the training set. You tell it, um, take the English sentence and three top piss in words and then um, make a data frame where the fourth word is the next column and you can see down here and if there's no more tokens then respond with the word end then afterwards it does some kind of word embedding take those english words and the top piss in words make some sort of vector that we can use for machine learning um, and I'm being really, really lazy here. I'm just using a count vectorizer and um, make a model from it. And then I've got another function to make multiple models. So make the model where you've got no top piss in words, make the model when you've got one top piss in word, make the model when you've got two, and keep on going until you get to about, I think it's about 19 words, which is, yeah, there was one time where a two words in English turned into something like... Mm, I can't remember what the actual number is, maybe 14 different uh, top pissing words in one sentence. Hopefully that's not going to be sitting in a menu somewhere because that's not going to fit real well. So here's the kind of output there. It's saying um, if I've got the English words and then 12 top pissing words, then the thing to predict would be Kilia with those 12 or with these 12, you should be predicting East up as in to, to be somewhere. Um and so let's let's build a translation model in real time. The fun part about these tiny vocabularies is that this training step takes you know 1.18 seconds, um, and even that's a little bit slow. I've only got like about 200 words of um, 200 phrases that I'm translating here. So and it's not using 100 GPUs on a parallel set of machines for a couple of weeks. Then the flip side is I need to be able to suggest the next token. So I've got a function that will take um, the English sentence, the tokens that we've output so far, and then suggest what the next token is. And then a function called suggest translation, which takes all the tokens one at a time. So I've, I've got my English sentence, gets the first token, then calls next token again with the English sentence and that first token, and then calls it again with the English length sentence and the first two tokens until it gets to an end. Okay, so let's just see how that works. Um, what's the, if I ask you to translate last page, now it's never seen that before. It's seen the word last and it's seen the word page, and it's smart enough to say, invert the word order. Like, it's not just trying to translate last, it translates page because that's what it should do. And then I say, okay, well, if you were translating last page and I gave you page, what would you emit next? Okay, I'll emit untap. And then if I was translating last page and I gave you page and untap, what would the next token be? And the answer is that that's the end of the, the phrase. It did pretty well on this, actually. Now, untap that's coming from the English on top of. So it's like the page that's on top of the one that you just have, which actually means previous. Um, but what's going on here is I think it was like the only other time it saw the word last was like the last document that you had open. And so that got translated as um, uh, computer uh, walk untap, the, the last as in the the one that was on top of where you were before. Still, it did pretty well. So it's getting the sense of the last page as in the page that was before the one that you've got at the moment. Um, or if I put the whole thing together, then it'll say page on top because it grabs all the tokens or um, next page. 
Notice that it, it knows that um, it can be the other way around. So Tumblr can appear before the noun. And so it's saying, well, seeing next page, what I think you probably want to have is um, page the noun second. Um, and it's, it's, it's able to understand that kind of word order, noun, then adjective, or adjective, then noun, depending on the context, which is pretty impressive machine learning, given that we've got such a tiny vocabulary. Um, as we add more vocabulary, this will then get smarter and its ability to predict translations will be better. And maybe it'll learn that last has a couple of different meanings. And so then it would be able to suggest something other than unpuppet. It could do a sort of like a finis, which is final. Popping back to my slides here and hoping it doesn't crash again. And as we sort of head down for the last 15 minutes of the talk, I've got to sort of have my warning scary part. Because now we need to talk about grammar and about number theory, uh, which is kind of an unusual place to, to go. One of the things that we need when we're localizing programs into languages, one of the really, really key useful things is to know how plurals uh, work. Um, it's really hard to not have a plural, you know, one document, two documents, you have many documents open, you have one document open. And in English, there's some pretty simple rules. Generally, you add the letter S. So cat goes to cats, dog goes to dogs, um, except if it ends in a vowel but, or it ends in a Y. With a Y, you have sky goes to skies and butterfly goes to butterflies and so on. And then there are irregular nouns. So person goes to people, sheep goes to sheep. Ox goes to oxen, which is kind of weird. And um, I mean, this is Linux conf, so Unix goes to Unixon. I have many Unix boxes, or I have many Unix boxen. Um, I've heard, I heard a plural for Docker yesterday, which I, I really liked, sort of Dockrin. Um, I have many Docker containers, so therefore I have Dockrin. I uh, hope that sort of catches on and gets into the dictionary soon. Um, Sorry, one more thing on that. And there's another principle of linguistics that it basically says no matter how stupid or weird or complicated um, some grammar rule is in the language that you're studying, so like person goes to people as a plural, no matter how complicated it is, the person next to you, their language has a rule that's even more complicated and more ridiculous, um, which is interesting. So what we're trying to do here is essentially we're making a machine learning model where I feed in the singular and out comes the plural. And with a bit of staring at this, it's actually pretty linear. Uh, it's locally linear for certain kinds of different words. So the rule that gets you from cat to cats is the same rule that gets you from dog to dogs. The only problem is that the residuals can be infinite. What by that I mean, um, if I plotted person on the singular here and then drew a spot for people as the plural, they're going to be way, way off. So that's going to ruin my line. If I try to minimize the sum of least squares distance on this line, I'm going to end up in serious trouble. It's, it's not going to produce correct results ever. And here's where I get to proudly talk about some of my research. Um, Kurt Hensel in 1897 came up with this idea of piatic numbers. And to completely paraphrase him, um, two numbers are really close together if they end with the same sequence of bits. This is a perfectly valid metric space. It's just as good as the Euclidean distance that you learned at school. There's a triangle inequality. There's infinitesimals. There, you can do calculus. It's very, very strange. So for example, three and five, um, they're very close. Because if you write them out, three is zero, one, one, and five is one, one. Uh, sorry, three is one, one, and five is one, zero, one. So uh, they're the same in the last bit. They both have a one at the end. So they're very close. Um, if you write 10 and 18 out in binary, they end up very close together uh, as well. In fact, the last three bits are the same. It's 0, 1, 0 is the last three bits. So they're very, very close. 
or two numbers that are really, really, really spectacularly close are uh, 1 and 65,537. Um, 65,536 is 2 to the 16, which means you have a 1 and then 15 zeros and then a 1, and that means that the last, the final 1 and the 15 zeros before it are in common. So those are really, really, really close together. So big deep breath, how it all ties together. I take my words and I just take the UTF-8 encoding of them and I use Hensel's measure of distance and then sky and butterfly are really close together because the last eight bits of sky is the letter Y and that's the same as the last eight bits of butterfly. Great, I've got eight bits similar. They're really, really close together. Now, dog and frog, they're unbelievably close together because they got the last 16 bits of their representation. So that means I can now do a linear regression using those numbers, just using the UTF-8 encoding. And instead of minimizing the sum of least squares, I'm minimizing the sum of this really weird formula, which is 2 to the power of negative the number of bits that were in common between the real answer and the fake answer. In other words, if my line predicted that the plural of dog was frogs, when the true answer is dogs, that'd be pretty close. It would, it would say, well, I've got OGS is the same. That's 24 bits. So that only counts 2 to the minus 24 in terms of penalty. It's so close. Um, so then uh, dramatic drum roll, add in lots of time um, and lots of research. So I, one of the things I proved last year is that you can actually um, solve these problems in a finite length of time. And then uh, I had to remember how to program in Haskell because like the whole point of academia is to look as though you're trying to be smart and programming in Haskell is how you look really smart. So I presume that works. And then open sourcing it because who on earth would commercialize it and just drop off on that text there, running it on another 1,500 languages for another 30,000 hours of compute time, I get um, some interesting results. So I'm, I'm hiding half of what I'm talking about here. Um, but looking at, say, Latin, um, one of the rules that came out was the plural is 256 cubed um, times x plus the letters for NES. And the plurals in uh, Bishlama and Tokpisin was all times 256 to the power 4 plus x. And if I look at the actual text there, um, rule 4 there on, on Latin, cogitatio goes to cogitationis. Cogitatio, multiply it by 256 cubed, and that'll shift you three spaces to the left, add in the ness on the end. And these translation rules are... Um, linear regression problems. And with Bishlama, the same kind of thing happens. Just add the word all at the beginning and it's a nice, simple linear regression problem. And linear regression problems are great because you don't need a lot of data for them. And what do you know? I have a very large number of languages for which we don't have much data, which means you know, as in the sort of preview there, yes, I can try and I can um, come up with the correct pluralization for 11% of the world's nouns. This is not fabulous. Um, my ability to uh, use this is limited firstly by the inaccuracy of the vocabulary extraction. So back earlier when I said it was about right 70% of the time when we we're pulling out individual words. Um, and then this technique for identifying singulars and plurals and how the grammar rules work, uh, that kind of works. Um, you can see if, you've, if you're colorblind, there's some green here. Um, if you are looking at this on a grayscale monitor, you probably can't see it, but the little green line here is the um, piatic linear algorithm that I, uh, that I developed. And generally, it's sort of right. 11% of the time is pretty confident. Um, sometimes it gets up to 30% correct. And very, very occasionally, it gets sort of 60 or 70% um, correct um, pluralization. So when we're a long way from being able to make a universal translator. But according to Star Trek, that only happens in 2155 anyway. So I've still got 130 years of improvements on this. 
But this is what you can do even on the barest, smallest languages. So um, this ran on um, Kun of, I'm sure I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly, um, Kunwijiku, which is a, a language of um, Arnhem Land, for example, where there's a few hundred speakers. It's, it's a very, very sparse language. I did uh, this also on some languages where, like, it's in the last stages of extinction where the only people who, who can speak the language are in their 60s or 70s. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, I've put up some URLs there if you want to contribute or um, just play around with it. Uh, I still haven't got very far in terms of synthesizing sentences. So until I can do that, um, I'm constrained on my ability to use uh, very parsimonious machine learning models, which really, really limits the accuracy of the translations. Um, and I need to work on better embeddings for these low resource languages. There are some techniques that have just come out where, you know, with a few tens of thousands of texts, you can do a sentence embedding that you can then improve on just using monolingual text. That's a bit better. That's got a bit more hope. Um, kind of hanging out for the open source speech to text engines. Um, Mozilla and their Common Voice project, they're making some progress on that, and I'm pretty confident that we'll see some, some good results there. And I'm also really hanging out for some alien races for us to communicate with so we can see whether these techniques are just human or whether they're actually universal to language itself. Um, now, given that I've um, kind of nearly run out of time and I'm talking about communicating with alien races, it's probably a good point to stop there. So um, how about I close off the presentation and let's see if there are any questions. Well, it was really good. It reminded me why I took social linguistics in third year <laughs> rather than syntax and computational <laughs> linguistics. Um, we have one question. We've got just enough time to go through. Um, there was a bunch about uh, putting the links in. So as I said, we're, we're a bit rushed for time. We'll get that into the post uh, post channel room uh, straight after this talk. Um, but the question is, what when you have such a small and distributed speaker base does it does it does it help or hinder to fix specific word meanings when you've got a small corpus to to kind of run through yeah if you've only got a very small vocabulary then anything you can do to improve it is good so for example um if i feed back um look last page comes out as page untup could you give me a translation for a correct translation for last page? Then, yeah, that should make a big difference on my um, accuracy. And so that's the process of I'm um, finding as many texts as I can where it's sort of getting it nearly right, and then we can improve each of those as it goes along. Great. Um, we will get those links to you. Um, I, I see there's, there's more, more questions coming in about links. Um, I'm just checking to see there's no final questions. Uh, well, shall I, I could pop up the screen or something like that with the last couple of links on it. Yeah, we'll, be, okay. we'll get them into the chat for sure. Um, okay. We'll, we'll harvest them from you in the, in, the, in the post chat in a few minutes and then get them to the eager participants. Yep. Cool. Well, I think that's pretty much us. So thank you once again, Greg. Um, Namihi. Okay. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes or so.